one. Sorry, I'm reading the source sheet first. Sorry. Um, so we're in the source sheet, not the Gemara. So source sheets. Spares, spares yeah, source sheets. So yeah. lots of paper, not many trees. Now it goes. Okay, okay. So the the, the, the Pasuk tells us you have to wear tefillin, but it doesn't actually tell us what it is. Like what color are tefillin? You'll see no verse in the Torah that tells us what color or what shape tefillin have to be. The second Pasuk, it says talking about the mitzvah of Shabbos. You know, every week we keep Shabbat, but all we're told is on six days work may be done. This is source number two. But on the seventh day, there shall be a Sabbath of complete rest a sacred occasion, and you shall do no work. It should be a Sabbath Hashem in all your dwelling places. Now, what's the definition of work? What is a malacha? That the, we, we say the word in the Pasuk here. It, it, we don't know what that is. I mean, there are those who, who say <clears throat> that to, you know, schlep heavy things around your house for the whole Shabbos is work, and therefore you shouldn't do such a thing. But that's not the biblical definition of malacha at all. Malacha on Shabbos means to do something that is creative. So you can, we wouldn't know this from the Pasuk. And we would think without the oral law that to strike a match is maybe not a problem on Shabbos. That's not a, a work. It's not considered work. You might think that going into your office and, you know, having a discussion about your um, assets and management, that might be more work related, but carrying you're not going to think that the word malocha implies carrying. And so it's quite vague. If you actually read just what the Torah says, it's very vague. And this is a personal favorite of mine. You see source number three. It says regarding Sukkot, you have to take the Arba, meaning the four different species. It says you shall take for yourselves on the first day a beautiful fruit, a pre eight hodah. I know lots of good looking fruit. You see a nice mango, you got maybe some, some fresh watermelon, that's maybe not a fruit. You got avocados, they might be droops. All right, but you get, you get lit, lots of good looking fruit. How on earth do we get from a pre eight hodder, which the Torah mandates us take, to an esrog? Where is that journey? And if you just read through the Torah, it's very vague. Now, there are those called the Tzedekim, the Sadducees, who took the Torah extremely literally. And they would only do literally what it says. So, for example, when it says in the Shema, um, you shall write al muzuzay speisecha. You shall write and put a muzuzah on the doorposts of your house. I imagine there were those who literally stood there with a, maybe a, a, a writing implement and wrote on the doorpost. When it says you shall put the tefillin between your eyes, they famously put the tefillin literally here because that's what between your eyes literally means. So, if you just go with the written text of the Torah. It's very ambiguous and not very clear. And I'm sure there are those who would cynically say, oh yeah, you know what? The Bible, the Torah, it's just very vague. And the rabbis, they've, they've made it all up and they've worked it all in. And that's where all this stuff comes from. But you see the Torah itself references the oral law. It, the, the, write, the writing in the Chumash testifies to the fact that there's something else going on. And that's in source number four. It's talking about the concept of Shechita ritual slaughter, which we need to make an animal kosher, we don't find any instruction in the Torah written down of how to shecht an animal. Yet, the Posuk in Devorim says, So when you, when you live far away, oh, when you live far away from the base of Mikdash, and you're going to travel up there, and you're going to shecht the cow, it says, as I have commanded you to slaughter the animal, where has God told us how to slaughter an animal? The answer is in the Chumash, in the Torah, he hasn't. So the Torah itself testifies to the fact that there's an oral law. Here. Why there has to be an oral law, we'll get to in a minute. Why couldn't we just have it all spelled out clearly? We'll get to that in a second. But for now, we see that if you just read through the Torah, there's a very clear need for something to qualify all these requirements. Now, source number five and six is a posuk that if you've been to Parashat Pals or any other Parashat Shea, you've definitely read. It says, Moshe Bahar Sinai Neymar. And then God spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai saying, and one of the most famous Rashis in the Torah says the Torah that 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 which is discussed with the introduction of at Har Sinai 
is the mitzvah of Shmita. And Rashi says, well, surely everything, all the mitzvahs were given at Harsina. So why is Shmita the mitzvah to leave your land fallow every seventh year? Why is that mitzvah introduced with, oh, and this one was told at Mount Sinai? All of them were told at Mount Sinai. So Rashi says, this is the, surely all commandments were said from Mount Sinai, rather to teach us that just as Shmita was taught with its general principles, specific practices and details at Sinai, so too all commandments were taught with their general principles and specific practices at Mount Sinai. So technically, Moses at Har Sinai, he gets the written Torah, but he also gets taught the oral law of how to transmit or the details, the gaps that we've left in things like etrog, you know, it says take a good looking fruit. So if he came down and they'd all be having, you know, mangoes and kiwis and apples and all these sorts of things. But Moses is given an oral law at Mount Sinai. So, so far we've said that if you read through the Torah, there are things that are very vague and need clarification. That clarifying force is called the oral law and it was given to Moses at Mount Sinai. Now, why is there a need for the oral law? What's the whole point? Maybe we should get back to this in just a second. How we can do this now? What's the whole point? Now, if we look at this Mishnah that we have today, the Mishnah is the oral law. Now, we all know very well that the Mishnah is written down. So why is the oral law now written down? And the answer is that it was seen that after the destruction of the Second Temple, people were forgetting. And this oral law wasn't being transmitted strongly enough. And so we had to fall back on a written form of the oral law. That day was a complete tragedy. It was a real tragedy. And the reason why we had an oral law and that which we lost by writing it down is explained by someone called Rav Shari Ragon. He says, the reason why we didn't write it down and we didn't sort of freeze it, we didn't freeze it in any sort of text is because when you're transmitting an idea, you're supposed to make it relevant to the audience that you're talking to. And so we look at the Mishnah now and it's written down and we see the laws of Nazik and damages are talking about cows goring each other. And we're talking about, you know, fires blazing through fields. If we had been able to keep the oral law going, we wouldn't have been talking about cows gorging each other. We would have been talking about car crashes. We wouldn't have been talking about interest in terms of prices of fields that are varying. We would have been talking about foreign exchange. We would have been talking about interest in terms of credit cards and compound interest and everything else. That was the ideal format. It was supposed to be an explaining qualifying force for the Torah that was relevant to each generation as it was. And it's a tragedy that it wasn't maintained and we end up with a form of oral law, which is in, in essence stuck in the past, but that's what had to happen. And this helps us explain why it is that there is so much dispute in the Gemara. The Mishnah is the oral law. The Gemara, the oral law as it's written down, the Gemara is the discussions about what the oral law actually is in this case and how it was applied and lots of disagreements. And if we had this chain of transmission, where are all the disputes from? You know, there was only one set of laws given at Mount Sinai. So why is everyone disagreeing with each other? And this is brought down in sources seven, eight and nine. We see there's a Mishnah in Chagiga. And there's a dispute here between someone called Yosei ben Yoyeze and Yosef ben Yoichna. And this was about whether one can lean on a sacrifice on Yom Tov in the temple. That's a, def- a separate discussion for a separate time about what exactly was going on there. But Rashi, the commentary says on that Mishnah that this was the first ever dispute that there ever was. And there really was a sense. Of, does anyone know, by the way, this is a trivia question, which I'll be stunned if anyone gets. There's one peric, there's one chapter in the whole of the Shisha Sidre Mishnah, in the whole of Mishnayas, that has not one dispute. Does anybody know what that chapter is? I think so. I think so. That's the, that's the Masechta. Yeah. Which peric? 
I think it's about. Is it, it, is it, it can, is a, um, is it okay? well, very good. We say every day in the Carbonus in Shacharis. <laughs> 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 Ezehu Makoma is the only parak in Shas that has not a single dispute. So, um, fun fact of the day. But the reason why we have so much dispute, unfortunately, today is the Tosfos says in source number nine that the students of Hillel and Shammai didn't learn appropriately. They didn't apply themselves sufficiently. And as a result, there was a weakness in people's grasp of the Torah that crept in. And that meant that serious measures had to be taken, such as the writing down of the Mishnahis. Um, unfortunately, we've never really recovered. After the destruction of the second base, I made the second temple, the Jewish grasp of halacha, of learning, of everything, our entire grasp on Torah became very weak. And it's only got weaker and weaker. And despite, you know, the amount of people that are learning in the world today, the amount of Jewish study that's going on today is more than there has ever been in history. We are at a peak of quantity of Jewish learning, but the quality is as weak as it's ever been. So um, no pressure, guys. Um, I think now we turn to a little historical journey I went on this afternoon. I was absolutely fascinated by when the Talmud went to print. So we all now have literally printed sheets, but, you know, this is a Gemara. And just, this is a Gemara over here. And the question is, when did they first start getting printed? It turns out the first Talmud, the first Gemara that ever got printed was by a non-Jew, was by a Christian. It was a fellow called Daniel Bomberg in Venice. I haven't, I haven't written this here, but he, uh, in Venice, yeah. He was a Venetian Christian who, I don't know why, but for some reason decided to employ a whole bunch of rabbis and scholars and all these other people. And he was the first one to complete a printing of the Babylonian Jewish in Talmud. And you'll see, very interestingly, this is a picture over here of a 1500s edition of the Talmud. It looks very similar to these pages that you'll have over here. And we'll get to that in a minute. You'll see also just slightly lower down the page. This is actually in the British Library. There is a, a copy of a Gemara from France from about 700 years ago. And um, this somehow managed to escape the mass burnings of Jewish books at the time. There was terrible anti-Semitism in France. And, you know, there was uh, somehow this Gemara miraculously escaped. But you'll see it looks very different to the one that was printed in Venice. And it doesn't have any country. It doesn't have country. Right, exactly. You'll see. We'll, we'll get to the, the breakdown of this Venetian print over here. But this copy of the Gemara here looks very different. Now, on the final page, you will see how everyone learns Gemara today. This is how everyone learns the Talmud. So this is commonly referred to as the Vilna edition, because it was printed by two Jewish brothers in Vilna. And you'll see at the, at the beginning of every Gemara, you'll see over here, the word Vilna. So it's, it's the Masechet Beitzah, tractate of Beitzah from the Babylonian Talmud, and it's printed in Vilna. My, my rabbi in Shiva, he actually has an original print from Vilna, like one of the first ones they actually printed. And because it's printed on an old typeset, you can feel the bumps of the letters. It's actually ink that's been dumped on a page as opposed to the laser, whatever we do now. So um, that was a real privilege to see that. But let's just get before we open the Gemara to the breakdown of how that the page actually works. So see A, that's in pink for you guys. A is the Mishnah. That's the written law as was written down by, by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi at the end of the second temple era and end of the, which is also the end of the second century. That's what all the fuss is about. So this pink section on your page, that's where all the problems lie. And that's something which all the discussions revolve around, basically speaking, or at least it's the starting point for all these discussions. B is the Gemara. That's the Talmud, and that's compiled by Rav Ashi and Ravina, Babylonian sages, and it's the recorded analysis, discussion, and disputes surrounding the Mishnah that occurred roughly between the years 300 and 500 CE. So this does go back quite a long way. And 
on the sides, you'll see, as someone quite rightly pointed out, we didn't see that on the French version of the Gemara we saw on the previous page, that there was anything around the sides. But these commentaries originally brought in by Bomberg in Venice have become the, the main uh, staple of how we learn Gemara today. So C is Rashi. Rashi was someone called Rabbi, Yosh, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki. It's funny enough, his father's name was Yitzchak. So his father's name would have been Yitzchak Yitzchaki. Just uh, putting that out there. And he is commonly referred to as the father of the commentators. The genius of Rashi, what I love about learning Rashi, is how concise he is, but how clear he is at the same time. Now, he died having only written commentaries on, I think, 31 of 39 of the volumes in the Gemara. And he was succeeded in some volumes by the Rush Bun, who is fantastic, but way more lengthy. And Rashi had this brilliant ability of commenting so concisely and so clearly. And every word really is a gem. Yes, Shlomo? I believe the Rush Bun carried on during Psachim. Was it Psachim? I think it's Psachim and it was also Basra. Basra as well, a bunch of places. So yeah, Rashi unfortunately didn't get to finish his work on the Talmud, um, but he didn't take up any rabbinic position knew what he was doing. And he actually earned a living as a wine merchant. So he was a real Frenchie, Rashi. He was one of the good ones. And um, D is Toisfus, Tosafot. That's on the outside of the page. So Rashi's always on the inside of the page. Tosafot's always on the outside of the page. And he was really, um, it's really a group of people. It, it literally means additions, um, additions, not really, additions. It started with Rashi's pupils. It has a few of Rashi's grandsons in it. And these guys take no prisoners. Rashi tries to make your life easier, Tosfot tries to make your life harder, and 99% of the time, if there's a problem in the Gemara, Tosfot is going to bring it up, and he's going to shove it in your face, and, um, you know, so much ink has been spilt over to Tosfot, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, um, but this is basically the introduction to the Gemara as we know it today, so it's the oral law as discussed, analysed, debated, and um, ultimately all halachic practice, Jewish conduct stems from this. So for the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to kick off Masechet Beitza, Tractate of Beitza, which word Beitza, funnily enough, actually means an egg, as I'm sure you all know. This Masechet, this tractate, this Gemara has absolutely nothing to do with eggs. It just happens to be the first word of the Masechet, of the Gemara. And you'll notice that all the commentaries all the Rishonim, they all refer to this volume in the Gemara as Masechet Yomtev. It's the, the tractate of Yomtev. And that's because, quite accurately, it discusses the laws of Yomtev. The first chapter discusses one of the fundamental differences between Yomtev and Shabbos. We all know that on Shabbos, you're not allowed to cook. It's a biblical prohibition to cook, and whatever form or shape that takes, you're not allowed to cook. On Yomtev, the Torah tells us that you are allowed to cook food that you need for that day. So the first peric predominantly discusses what exactly are the parameters of cooking on Yom Tov. We all know you can't just light up a fire, cook whatever you want on Yom Tov. It's a bit more complicated than that. Um, there is a massive discussion as well about whether it's called Beitza or Beya, um, but that's a discussion for another time. I advise you to anyone who's interested to look at the Teferis Yisrael on the Mishnayis and uh, a safer called the the Afike Yehuda, but it's we'll call it Beitzah for now. Right, let's get kicked off. So the Mishnah that's going to be the first section we're doing. I don't know how much we're going to get done today, but the Mishnah starts as follows: Beitzah Shenolda Beyontif. You have an egg that's laid on a Yontif. Let's say what's the next Yontif coming up? Um, Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. It's not a good example. <laughs> Let's do the previous one. Let's do Shavuos, right? Shavuos. An egg that was laid on Shavuos. Beis Shammai Obrim, the house of Beis Shammai, they say, Toicha, you can eat this egg. So your chicken, let's call the chicken Daisy. Daisy lays an egg. On Shavuos, Beis Shammai say, eat that egg. U Beis Hillel Obrim, Toicha. And Beis Hillel say, do not eat it. Now, let's jump to Rashi on the inside of the page. We've had this, we've, we, we're entering a debate now, can you eat an egg that was laid on Yom Tov? So Rashi says, you're not allowed to eat it on that day. Meaning an egg that's laid on Shavuos, 
you can eat it after Shavuot, it's fine. But there's a prohibition of eating that egg on Yom Tov itself. Uh, and Rashi, he knows you're stressed, he knows you're worried, he says, don't worry, the Gemara is going to explain why this is. Again, Rashi making our lives easy, all very good. And he follows on as well, um, as right, so that's Rashi. Now, Tosfus immediately is making our lives a misery. So you see Tosfus on the outside of the page. Tosfus, uh, what's going on here? Teichal, you can eat it, like Teichal, it's not, it's not halachic terminology. The way we talk in halacha is osa or mutter. Is permitted or it's not. So Tosh says, what's this whole expression of toichal and lo toichal? So Tosh says, goes straight away. The imtoma says Tosh says, this is on the outside of the page, the top top line there. Am I lo tama oisrin umatirin? Why don't we just say it's forbidden or it's allowed? The chitema. And Tosh says, if you're going to try and tell me that oisrin, that the word forbidden, mashma implies she'osa la'ina, that you'd never be able to have it. And we know from Russia that's not the case. That's not true. Meaning, says, you might try and say the reason why we say you can eat it versus you can't eat it is because if you said it is a forbidden egg, then you say, well, I can never eat this egg. And that's not really true. You're allowed to eat this egg just after Yom Tov. So he says, that's not a good answer. Don't try saying that's the reason they didn't use the word Asa. And he says, he brings a proof from later on. I'm going to basically skip down. And he says that on the first narrow line, the So he says, it may be the reason why we have this interesting terminology. Of eating and not eating, do you have a tony oysrinumatira? If it said it's permitted or it's forbidden, I would have said, Shema Shema Tirin Habitza Hainulatalt. The permission, the permission given for this egg is carrying it. Avoba Achila Asura. I would have said that maybe eating it would be forbidden. And that's the first answer of Tosis. The reason why we say Taicha is because if you said that I'm not allowed, if, if you would have said it's Osa, I would have thought that. Sorry, if I said it, you're allowed to eat, your, this egg is permitted, I would have thought, what's the permission given? The permission given is to carry it. But to eat it, I would have said no. So therefore, we spell out very clearly that the permission given here is toichal. You're allowed to carry it, you're allowed to eat it, all is amazing. Yes, Sean? So if you can carry either. That's what we're going to get into. That's what we're going to get into. Uh, yeah, someone's made a very good point that the laws of what you can and can't carry on Tov are quite different. We're going to get there. We're going to get 100%. So shouldn't we learn that from this tomorrow? From which tomorrow? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we learn a lot of the stuff about carrying and cooking from this tomorrow? We're going to run into four opinions about what this... We have a debate with Shammai and Hillel. We're going to enter four different opinions what this b- debate is actually about. We don't really understand at this juncture what they're arguing about. And this is classic Mishnah. We don't really understand what the point of contention here is. But um, yeah, Ruben, hold on. We, we, Rashi, Rashi's told us, but Gemara Mufarish Tama, we're going to get to a, a bit more clarity. But for so far, we have to understand what is this whole expression of you're eating or you're not eating or you're, versus the normal expression, which is you're allowed or not allowed. So Tosis has said that I, we're explicitly saying that you can eat it to make sure to show that you're allowed to eat this. Another answer given by Tosis here, just a bit further down, is, let me just see if I can find it. But yeah, very simply, very simply, what do you do with eggs? You eat them. So this is okay. So you can eat it versus you can't eat it. It's just applying the, the forbidden and permitted activities to that which we're talking about. We're talking about eggs, what can you do with eggs? You eat them and it's all very nice. But I'm just trying to think, should we do the third answer? No. Okay, fine. That's basically two answers Tosis gives. The reason why we use this anomalous expression of eating versus not eating, as opposed to osa and mutter, forbidden and permitted, is because, firstly, if you just said it's forbidden, I would have thought it would be only the eating, sorry, only the carrying, sorry, if I would have said it's permitted, I would have thought only the carrying is permitted, but the eating is for, is forbidden. And the second answer is that, no, this is just what we're talking about. I have seen other commentaries who just say, everyone calm down. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It's just the way Mishnah's talking. But um, just at the end of Tosfus, I'm, I'm not going to go into it into immense detail now, but we see that while this makes sense for Beis Shammai to use this terminology, even though Beis Shammai really, it would make sense to say an expression of eating versus not eating, for Beis Hillel, it would make more sense to say Osa and Mutter. It would make sense to stick with the more typical expressions. And the answer Tosis gives is very important when we're looking at the Mishnah. He says the reason why we stick with this expression of eating and not eating, and as opposed to switching to forbidden and permitted, is because it's easier to remember. 
And we have to remember, these Mishnayot, these Mishnas that we see here, were originally, basically speaking, memorized. So a lot of the format and the structure of the Mishnah was how can we make it easy to remember? So even though technically it would make more sense to maybe use a different expression, and it might even be more accurate, the primary focus is the ease of memory. And uh, it's just very important to remember that we're, we're sitting here with written texts, but for hundreds of years, thousands of years, it was all transmitted verbally. Right, so that's Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel. Um, the first dispute. The first dispute is about an egg that was born on Yom Tov, laid on Yom Tov. Beis Shammai say you can eat it, and Beis Hillel say you can't. It's also important. Can I ask a question? Yes, hello, Abby. <laughs> Um, isn't, isn't, wouldn't you expect usually Shammai and Beis Hillel to take exactly the opposite view? Because Beis Hillel are usually more they're usually strict than Beis Shammai. That was literally what I was going to say next. Oh. Well done, Andy. Andy, as our experienced Talmudist over here has pointed out, Beis Hillel are usually the most popular guys in the book because they are usually more lenient. Beis Shammai are usually much more strict. And Andy has pointed out quite rightly that in this Mishnah, we see that Beis Hillel are being the strict guys and Beis Shammai are trying to be everyone's friends. And we're going to, this actually explains very nicely the continuation of the Mishnah. We're going to continue the Mishnah now. We're going to see another two disputes between Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel. And in all three cases of this Mishnah, Beis Shammai are more lenient and Beis Hillel are more strict. And this is extremely anomalous. And as far as I know, these are the only three times that we see Beis Shammai being more lenient. So although the next two cases don't necessarily have anything to do with what we're going to discuss later, because it's easier to remember the three times that Beis Shammai are more lenient, we put them all in the same boat. So the next two cases in the Mishnah, we are not going to discuss really ever, but because this initial case is anomalous we want to keep the anomalies together as Andy has pointed out so accurately it makes it easier to remember so you're all going to remember this for the next week right um this is the uh this is the second case but some might say so because I there's a prohibition we know on Pesach that you're not allowed to eat anything that's chomets what about something that is chomets meaning yeast something which causes things to ferment. What about a fermenting agent? We all know this because we've all done sourdough over COVID. Am I right? Am I right? Anyone not done sourdough? Richard, you did sourdough. Oh, he's the baker. He didn't do sourdough. So the way you make things sourdough, I'm very unreliably informed, is you get a culture. Is that a thing? So it's essentially a bit of um, dough itself. As far as I understand, it's a bit of dough itself that you use to ferment the rest of your dough. So that's not really something we'd think of as chomets. It's a fermenting agent. So we shall say here, that in order to violate the prohibition of chomets on Pesach, you have to have a kazayas, an olive-sized amount of a fermenting agent. It's actually, I think, less. I'm not sure. What's bigger, I felt, when kazayas or kaseves? Yeah, except it's smaller. Yeah, so it's a smaller amount. And although you wouldn't think of it typically as chomets, I think it's because it's the sort of it's the source of chomets. This is you know what gets your chomets going. So it's a smaller amount. the chomets book big so service. But chomets to actually violate the prohibition of chomets on Pesach, you have to have a date-sized amount of chomets. So if you want to have a piece of bread on, on Pesach, which is not advised, but in order to violate the biblical trip. Prohibition, you're going to have to have a date sized amount. Um, don't give you the leniency of chomets. They don't give you the bigger amount of the date. They say, no, both of them are a kazais. Yes, surely they're just more lenient. Uh, surely their service is more than a kazais. So they're more make up. They're more relaxed because you have to have a date sized amount in order to violate the prohibition, as opposed to base hillel, who say, in order to be high, you only have to have a kazais. Yeah, but I thought we were saying this is where they're showing us uh, more lenient. They are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, so you have to have more, you have to have, you're only accredited if you if you have a bigger piece of comments. If your piece of comments is this big, yeah. then you definitely, if it's only this big, then you have more. So, if it, so they're giving you more leeway than how much comments or how much 
crazy agent you can have. So they're saying, yeah. if you've got this size, you're, you're okay for the intervention, like you're not okay for the Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yes, so what goes to the theme? I thought the prohibition is also that you can't own. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So in terms of ownership, we're not talking ownership here. Yeah, ownership, I think, is maybe even a, even a tiny bit. Right. Um, and this is another completely, you know, irrelevant case. We're not really going to talk about this, but because again, it's anomalous in that be shamay more relaxed. We see that if someone slaughters a um, wild animal or a bird beyond, this is very. These are two animals are listed because there's a mitzvah attached with the slaughtering of these animals. We'll get there. Be shamay omim. Be shamay say if you've slaughtered this animal on yontif, yachbar bedekev yichasim. You should dig up some earth in order to cover the blood of the animal. There's a very, there's a, there's a mitzvah when it comes to slaughtering certain animals and birds that you have to cover the blood of the animal. Does anyone know why? Again, the hard trivia today. Does anyone know why there's a specific mitzvah to cover the blood of certain animals? I'm gonna go with Richard. Show you respect the life force of the animal. Yes, very true. That, that, that is definitely um, the sensitivity behind, but it's only certain animals. It's only chayav Like an uh, Not the answer I've heard. Okay. It's not the answer I've heard. Yes, someone. Uh, maybe it's an impurity? I, have no, I haven't heard that answer either. The answer I saw in the Medrash is that when Cain killed Hevel, we're talking Cain and Abel way back when. So unfortunately, as this was the first murder ever, Cain had no idea how to kill his brother. He had no idea how to do it. And so he, he it's, it's a bit gruesome, but he basically tried to smite various parts of his body, trying to work out what would kill him. So he'd be like, you know, you know trying to hit his knee and his elbows and his shoulders. And, and because it took so long for him to actually kill him, there was unfortunately blood everywhere. And the Medrash says that it was the, these specific chayav aif, these animals and birds that covered up Hevel's blood that was scattered all over the floor. And as a gesture of thanks for their sensitivity in covering up Hevel's blood, we cover up their blood when we have to eat them. But, it, it, but, it, but the Issa says that the dam is, is considered nefesh. Yeah, that's an Issa of Achilas dam. Yeah, right. But it compares dam to nefesh. Yeah, so that's like Shlomo saying of Tumah and Tara. The, the, the difference with Tina is when it comes to the Ki Adam Hu Anefesh and Tumah and Tara, it has to be a Revius of Dam, which is quite a lot. You're not going to get a Revius of Dam out of a bird. You know, you got like a, a Revius is, you know, depending on what, which opinion you go to, it's something like 180 milliliters. Yeah, but you get that out of a deer, but of a bird, you wouldn't. So this is, this is a, a Minha Torah requirement to cover even a small amount. Um, so, just going back to our point, Beis Shammai say, if you have an animal that you're slaughtering, a chayav oif that you have, you slaughtered on Yom Tov, you dig up earth, which you really shouldn't do on Yom Tov, but you dig up earth and you cover the blood. You should actually not shech the animal at all. Don't shech it, because then you're going to have to dig up the earth. So Beis Hill are more strict than that, you're not allowed to shech this animal. If you already had dust that you could use, that you had prepared before Yom Tov for this very purpose, then you can, then you're allowed to shech this animal, you're allowed to slaughter it. And Beis Hill agree, even from their strict position, if he forgot or he made a mistake and he actually did slaughter this animal and now the blood is on the floor, then nonetheless, you should still dig up some earth and you should cover the, the blood. And he also agrees that you can assume that any ash you have in an oven is you know, assumed to have been dedicated for blood covering purposes. And that brings us to the end of the first Mishnah in Beitza, where we've seen about three... Uh, Disputes Beis Shammai and Beis Hill have about firstly an egg that was laid on Yom Tov, about a uh, the amount of chomets you can eat on Pesach in order to be um, violating a biblical prohibition, and whether you can sh slaughter an animal on Yom Tov and then dig up earth to cover its blood. And as you can see, these are quite archaic examples. You know, if we hadn't had this tragedy of that weak attitude to Jewish learning, we would be talking about potentially far more modern day things. Um, 
you know, we wouldn't be talking about eating so'od, which is this culture, we might be talking about eating marmite, because marmite is heavily yeast based. I don't, I don't know, no, no modern day examples exactly spring to mind. But um, that is basically where we're going to hold off today. Thank you everyone for coming. It's a really, really big privilege and pleasure to have you. Looking forward to continue on this journey on the Sechus Beitzah together before too long. And um, I think we're now going to have Cholent and Kugel for all and sundry. Oh, hey. Which you're allowed to eat today. Which you're allowed to eat today. <laughs>